You know, I remember uh, 20, maybe 25 years ago, uh, many years ago, when I was at the beginning of my business career, uh, we're all young with my friends. Uh, at that time, I remembered a meeting that was widely reported between, I believe, President Bill Clinton of the US and Chinese President Jiang Zemin. So during that meeting, uh, Bill Clinton said to him, said to his Chinese counterpart that, look, you know, we're okay with China developing and getting rich, but you can't get rich the way we did. If you get rich the way we did, we'll all be in trouble, okay? And it was a widely reported uh, meeting. Um, and at that time, we were all young. We we're just starting our career. China was sort of taken off. We were flabbergasted by that statement. Th that statement struck us as, as such hypocrisy and immorality. We were struck by, by, by that statement. We thought it was frankly immoral that you, know, you, you, you developed, you, you, you emitted all this stuff in, into the uh, atmosphere. And then now you're telling us that we're gonna stay poor forever because you wanna protect the environment. It's not that, that you, you're, gonna, you're gonna take your wealth and spread it and have us share it. You're not gonna do that. So, so we're gonna be poor forever. Of course, China had evolved and developed tremendously. We became the largest industrial uh, base in the world, uh, the industrial base for the world. I mean, our industrial capacity is bigger than the US, Japan, and Germany combined. We make everything for the world, okay? And um, during that much of that period, uh, China insisted on the principle of common and differentiated responsibility for, for ecology, for the environment, which reflected the sentiments that I and many of my colleagues and compatriots of my generation shared, which was that outrage that, you know, the West, the developed world had done all this damage. And at least you got to give us a chance to catch up <laughs> in our development. Once we're more or less on equal footing, then we can talk about how do we reduce it together. Okay. And you reduce it first, right? So common and differentiated responsibility that characterized much of my, uh, China's development in my career, uh, but also in the same period, we, the Chinese people, and myself included, realized and witnessed the amazing, tremendous environmental degradation that accompanied our development, our industrial development. You know, um, you, know you couldn't see clear sky in Beijing for, for, for months on end, uh, for a while, for many years. Uh, and then, of course, you know, when Bill Clinton made that statement to Jiang Zemin, climate wasn't at the forefront. In the last five, 10 years, all the science is showing that, you know, Bill Clinton was right. If we emit carbon dioxide like the West did on a per capita basis, uh, the entire world will be in trouble. And we're far from there. You know, our, our per capita income is, what, a, a fourth of the US? Um, so, so I think, you know, things, the mindset and outlook and, and political outlook have changed. Like I said, China is still a developing country. It is nowhere near the wealth and per capita income of the developed West, which had led the carbon emission for 100, you know, 150 years. Um, and we're nowhere near that. Um, but China decided just on a matter of principle that because this, this thing, this concerns it, all of the world uh, to give up that principle to discuss how we can work together to, to achieve climate goals. And second is uh, uh, more um, personality driven. Um, I think since 2012, uh, since Xi Jinping came to power, um, Xi Jinping is a committed environmentalist. Uh, it's, it's, I think he's probably one of the most committed environmentalists that are world leader, among world leaders in the world today. Okay, and he means it. Uh, it's through the policies, and at first the, the policies were very tough, um, and we were all worried that it would affect economic development. Uh, there was an area, a region called uh, uh, Arhai. Arhai was in the city of Dali. Arhai was the, one of the largest body of freshwater lake uh, in China for short. Sure. It was a beautiful region, pristine, but very poor, very very poor. Okay, um, and twenty some years ago. Uh, the region began to develop. 
um, and it got wealthier and wealthier. Um, tourism, of course, accounted for, by 2012, accounted for nearly half. At the same time, our high became totally polluted. You could smell the water, the sewage and all the, the tourism industry, the hotels. It was uninhabitable almost. Incredible how fast it happened, that, like 10 years. And in 20, I believe it was 2013 or 14, uh, President Xi Jinping went and visited our high. We were all surprised that he went there. And he said that this needs to be fixed. Um, we're not going to leave our children, you know, one of our national treasures like this. Um, so in a short five-year period, okay, this is unprecedented in history, they cleaned up our high. And the, the, the resistance, the low interest groups, think about how, much, how many economic interests are involved, how many commercial interests, political interests, when you undertake such an initiative. Um, enormous businesses got shut down. All the hotels were pulled back 100 meters from the lake. Um, and the government invested and built in record time, two to three years, unheard of, a sewage management system, a water treatment system around the lake. And it's an enormous lake. I think it's the, probably the largest water treatment lake uh, system in the world today. It was built in two years. In the process, uh, they demoted about nearly 200 officials for lagging in their execution. Okay. Um, so, so now if you go to our high, at, at five years, I mean, beginning like 27, 2018, the water was pristine. Two thirds, I think 250 or 207 days out of the year, they achieve a grade two level of, of water cleanliness, which means you can drink it. There was a lot of resistance in, from our local businesses. Now they welcome it because uh, uh, there's higher level of, uh, of tourism. So that's our high. Second story I want to share was closer by here in Zhejiang province in Pujiang. Uh, Pujiang was uh, near Hangzhou. You know, Hangzhou was a beautiful tourist region, but Pujiang is further into the mountains. So there wasn't a lot of uh, infrastructure. So it always lagged behind very much in development. It was very poor. Again, also 20 some years ago, they figured out a way to industrialize. They decided to make Pujiang a center for crystal making, making crystals. The region got really rich, but again, the environment got destroyed. Okay, it was a beautiful mountainous region. The, the lakes, the rivers were like cafe latte. Around the same time, 2013, 2014, uh, a new provincial party secretary uh, came to power uh, from, the new, from the Xi Jinping administration. And he pushed through a Wu Shui Gong Zi, five, five water issue treat, uh, uh, policy. In record time, I, I was just there last year, okay, five years, cleaned it up. The, the water was pristine. What they did is they shut, they consolidated, there were about 25,000 crystal studios, crystal workshops, the small fragmented industry. They consolidated into several hundred larger companies and they moved them to industrial parks so they could share the water treatment and sewage and industrial waste uh, treatment uh, facilities. Actually, revenue and margin both jumped over a five-year period after they, uh, they, 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 they changed this. Um, so these stories are happening everywhere in China. Um, so I think we're, China is going to trot a path that is different from industrialized West. We're going to try to be ecologically mindful and develop the economy at the same time. So I'll, I'll share these stories. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's great to be with you and uh, nice to follow Eric. Uh, although, Eric, that cafe latte crack is complicated because um, you never know how hipsters are going to react to that. Maybe they'd like the polluted water if it reminds them of cafe latte. So there's that. I'm speaking to you from Mexico City, which used to have one of the worst air pollutions in the world. Um, but I want to talk to you actually immediately about India and then develop that to talk about the choices before not only India, but Eurasia regarding what you know we might call leapfrogging over carbon civilization or what we might call finding a new path. So it's very clear that when we look at India, country about the same population size as, as China, one of the, I think now the fifth largest economy in the world, country that has actually been 
um, making some interesting contradictory strides. Um, some things positive, lots of things negative, but that's for another day. There are five areas I want to put on the table where you can talk about a green agenda, the need for a green agenda. The first area is air pollution. Well, in India, 75% of the medium to large cities violate the Indian government's own air pollution standards. Air pollution is a serious problem. And it's not just industrial pollution. It's also poor um, consumer practices for heating. A lot of poor people are forced to burn charcoal, to burn you know, wood, whatever they can find, even rubber. Um, to heat themselves. So poor infrastructure, basic residential infrastructure puts heavy particulate matter into the air. There's also other reasons for air pollution. Uh, one of them being reliance upon trucking rather than using the rail system to transport goods and so on. But one of the issues is air. Second is energy. India is, as you know, reliant upon either energy imports or burning coal. These are the two areas um, of energy. There are times when I've seen the budget in India go up to about 6% of GDP for energy imports. So it's, it's also expensive to be importing um, crude oil from the Gulf, crude oil from other parts of the world, also uh, natural gas. It's expensive. And it's expensive. It's a foreign exchange drain. So the question of energy is important, you know, to think about renewables and so on. The third is resource efficiency. If you actually look carefully at industrial production in most countries, most countries in the world are quite inefficient with the use of resources. I think this is of great concern, particularly if India is going to expand its domestic industrial development capacity, a better use of the domestic resources, metals and minerals, I think is, is of importance. The fourth thing, of course, is waste. We know that you know, an enormous amount of plastic is generated in our world. I'll give you a small example. In India, until quite recently, tea and coffee used to be served on trains in little terracotta mugs. Um, this had two benefits. One, there was an enormous artisanal production of terracotta mugs, so it was an employment-generating mechanism. The railways would buy these um, little mugs called coolers from artisans. Secondly, after you finish the cup of tea, you just threw it out of the window because it was entirely compostable. It was made of mud. Um, well, the Indian government decided to modernize the railway and we moved from this perfectly good form of, of um, drinking tea and coffee on the train to plastic cups. And so now people with the same habit of drinking beverage and throwing it out of the window just throw the plastic cups out of the window. So the rail lines in India are littered with plastic. Now, the last thing is water. I talked about air, energy, resource efficiency, waste, and then water. Water pollution is a pressing issue in India. And I think here, the matter is not just about, um, about you know, better technology to purify water and so on, but there's a hazard to the way in which we've developed our industries. The pollution of, of groundwater has become pretty endemic. Rainfall is erratic. Therefore, reservoirs don't get filled up. You get, you know, a combination of flooding and drought. That's what happens when you get really catastrophic weather systems. Um, you're not getting the kind of uh, filling up of reservoirs and so on. Anyway, these are the five principal issues on the table for India. Question is raised, well, how are we going to solve these things? There are two direct roads. One, let's call it the Western Road. The other is the Eurasian Road. So first, the Western Road. What is the Western Road? Look, frankly, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, uh, private financing from the United States and from Western Europe is simply not available for any green transition. It's just not available. And if it's available, it's only available with deep conditionalities that come with the kind of austerity that we just don't need. So on the question of financing, the Western development model right now is pretty broke. I mean, you look at the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the grant they've given to Nepal is $500 million. Okay, that's just to build electrical lines. 
um, that's just not even you know in the ballpark of the kind of money needed for the great green transition. So if you look at the Western developmental model, there's just no financing available. And secondly, there's no appetite in that model to um, really release technology from patents. I mean, intellectual property rights regime, the TRIPS regime, um, is absolutely religiously sacrosanct in the WTO. And, and look, we've seen the way in which those property rights have been sacrosanct during the COVID pandemic. I mean, if you're not going to release it during the COVID pandemic, well, I mean, I would argue that the climate catastrophe is equivalent, if not more deadly, because it leads to annihilation, but there's no appetite to release it. Well, that's the Western development model, pretty limited in my opinion. There's a Eurasian model, which could be interesting and could be something I think to consider. Um, look, frankly, um, Russia has 24% of world's natural gas. And if you could see pipelines across Eurasia uh, linking the continent and not the continent, the two continents together, um, this is actually to the benefit of countries like India. You know, uh, the United States had a private company, one may remember, called Enron, which tried to develop a liquefied natural gas terminal at Dabol in Maharashtra. The entire project was riddled with corruption and had to be scrapped. Also, it would have been much too expensive for the Indian consumer. India can't afford it. And Russia has 24% you know, of the world's natural gas resources, an amazing resource. China, on the other side, of course, is the world's leader in solar and wind. And the Belt and Road is put on the table financing mechanisms including through the People's Bank of China, which is not as onerous as the IMF has demonstrated in the past six decades. So there's a possibility of Eurasian integration. In fact, that's indeed what was going on when Poland joined the Belt and Road in 2019, when Italy joined the Belt and Road and so on. Well, here comes the third point. There is a hindrance being placed before what I consider the historical fact of Eurasian integration. There are two hindrances before us, two blocks to that. What are those blocks? The first has been demonstrated in Ukraine. This is that the United States and its, some of its allies will do anything to prevent Eurasian integration. This is a conflict about a natural historical fact that the United States has tried to block. In fact, the best evidence of this, and you know, one can say, well, Trump was an aberration. I don't actually believe so. Trump's comments to Jens Stoltenberg at a meeting uh, held a few years ago were quite clear. What Trump said was, why should the United States spend money on NATO if Europe is going to buy natural gas from, from, from Russia? And he put on the table the fact that he would be okay with the United States, quote unquote, defending Europe. But what he wanted was the Europeans to cut natural gas uh, in other words, to cut Nord Stream 2. So this anxiety about the natural and historical fact of Eurasian integration is the first hindrance um, for the development of a green transition. And indeed, this war in Ukraine is going to increase the anxiety in Germany, where they're going to not be able to shut down nuclear power plants. They might even return to reliance on coal and so on. So the first hindrance is what I would think of as the US anxiety about Eurasian integration. The second hindrance is closer to home, and that is the un, um, unbridged gap between India and China, uh, which you know continues to actually destroy the possibilities of proper Eurasian and Asian integration. Recently, India's external affairs minister, Jay Shankar, was asked about this issue. And he said, look, India and China's problems predate the Ukraine conflict. Don't drag us into your conflict. It's not a conflict about the rest of the world. And therefore, it needs to be sorted out between Beijing and Delhi. Asian integration or a pan-Asian project has been destroyed by two historical facts. One is the ugly legacy of Japanese imperialism. That really destroyed the idea of pan-Asianism. But that's now in the past. The current block to pan-Asianism or Asian integration is the tension between India and China. And I want to put it on the table that that tension actually has nothing to do with Arunachal Pradesh and, and Aksai chain. Because those 
Border disputes are solvable. You know, those areas can be treated as condominiums. They can be jointly developed. There can be all kinds of creative ideas put on the table to deal with them. The issue is there's no appetite for creativity. The countries are at a standstill and it's up to us in a way, actors such as us, people such as us, to open the discussion and have, I think, to raise some of these creative issues. So what I want to say is that for a country like India, the green technology, the leapfrog into the next phase isn't going to come from begging the IMF or the World Bank for a grant. The only way it's going to happen is if India is able to properly integrate with China and Russia, if complementarities are there on the table for all these countries. That's the only way that Asia or in fact Eurasia are going to be able to meet climate targets. Look, frankly, we are not able to meet sustainable development goal number one, which is eradication of hunger. How are we going to meet the other 16 SDGs? But the climate issue is a life and death issue. And for that, I think we need to be very serious about what we're talking about. No point beating around the bush. And so I hope I haven't beaten around the bush. Thanks a lot. I want to just talk about the, the solutions to climate change that I see coming through a three-part recipe, which is policy, technology, and finance. And uh, each of you has already covered uh, some of that to some degree, but also in the sense of what the barriers are. But I see enormous possibilities, especially if we end the concept of waste. One slide that I was going to show you, here in Los Angeles, we get very little rain, but when we get it, it comes down in buckets. We get an average of 12 rainstorms a year, and they're very violent. We get a lot of rain. And there was a community in the North Los Angeles area called Sun Valley that was flooded out every year and no way to get rid of the water without flooding their homes and businesses. So a, a very creative city planner realized that there was an old dilapidated city park and that if you dug up that park and you put in cisterns, just ordinary old Roman technology, thousands of year old technology, probably actually invented by the Chinese even before the Romans. And they now capture 8,000 acre feet of water, which is a lot of water. So they now collect 8,000 acre feet a year, which is about four times what their community needs. So they sell the rest to the water agencies. Another example of that, uh, of where policy actually started all of this was with California wanting to be energy efficient. Back in the 1970s, Governor Jerry Brown, who later became governor uh, just 10 years ago, five years ago, um, again, back in the 70s, he was governor and he formed the California uh, Energy Commission. And one of their mandates was to find ways to make energy use more efficient. And so the policymakers uh, started to mandate that refrigerators would become more efficient over time. Of course, they did their homework. They had to prove that it was technologically feasible. But, uh, but they mandated that the refrigerators, TVs, all kinds of other appliances would have to become more and more efficient over time. The same way we regulate cars to be more and more clean over time and more energy efficient to get more miles per gallon over time. And that led to all kinds of innovation in the, in the technology. And the result is that California is today 40% more energy efficient than the rest of the United States. And I could go on with quite a few other examples, we imposed a small fee when you buy a television in California, for example, or a new computer, you pay $4 or $8 recycling fee. That money goes into a fund, which then the recycling industry, if you recycle electronic waste, you can apply for 47 cents per pound for every pound of electronic waste that you recycle from that fund. So that way you're subsidizing this new industry. And the result is uh, when I was EPA secretary in 2005 and we kicked this program off, uh, today millions of tons of electronic waste come through an enormous industry that didn't exist before, that created jobs, that's harvesting a wide variety of metals and plastics and even uh, computer components that can be recycled and resold and reused. It's created an amazing industry. So policy really matters, but of course the technology matters too. So when I was EPA secretary, I had to comply with a new law that required us to reduce emissions from cars, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which previously had never been regulated. And it was my job, my staff's job, to prove that whatever measures we took or whatever we, we said the car industry had to meet was technologically and economically feasible. 
So it was important for us to know that. And sure enough, it's one of the reasons that hybrid cars like the Prius or other hybrid vehicles were invented. So that led to all kinds of innovation, which of course we found was technologically and economically feasible. But the last piece of that recipe of policy, technology, and finance, I think comes into, uh, into play when we're looking at large-scale things like uh, large-scale renewable energy projects, especially in developing countries where investors might have uh, a challenge to understand the market or understand the risks. And that's why I work a lot with uh, finance institutions, the UN Green Climate Fund, uh, philanthropists and other kinds of uh, investors who are willing to build blended capital products. So we have, for example, uh, recently created the Subnational Climate Fund, which is a, a $750 million investment fund. Uh, it's about to be followed by a $2 billion one just for India, where we uh, invest in these climate solutions at scale, uh, but 20% of the capital stack is provided by these concessionary uh, investors, Green Climate Fund and others. So they take the first risk and that makes it more attractive to senior conventional investors, pension funds and so on to come in as the senior investors. In India, for example, we've been working in Gujarat, the Western state of Gujarat with 18 municipalities on uh, waste projects, which probably wouldn't have been viable in the past, but thanks to Prime Minister Modi, they are today. So it worked in many places, but now these small municipalities have overflowing landfills. So we're working with them to turn that material into something useful. The other uh, program that is helping that uh, is the Satat program, which uh, is trying to develop the biogas industry in India because India doesn't have much of a, an oil and gas industry. So all of that is imported, as Vijay mentioned before, but you can make biogas from uh, organic material, particularly food waste and organic and, and agricultural waste, um, and turn that into methane, which can then be burned in uh, buses and, and taxis and even the tuk-tuks that drive around Delhi and other things. So again, the policy led to the economics uh, and, and even the technology in that case uh, with these 18 municipalities, we're helping them with turnkey uh, kits in essence that will convert 150 tons uh, per day of organic waste into biogas and 150 tons of other material that you can't recycle, the material that's too hard to recycle into a refuse derived fuel, which ultimately will be converted into a low carbon jet fuel with new technology uh, coming out of California. And these are all things which work because the policy is set to reduce emissions, the, the mandates are set, whether it's on the car industry or the aviation industry or whatever, the technology is available. So we as government officials can mandate something that's possible. And then the third piece of course is finance. And then the last thing I wanna say relates to China. We've been working for some years with uh, Xia Shenhua, who is the uh, Chinese negotiator for climate change. And uh, he was a, a good friend, is a good friend, and uh, was a colleague when I was in government uh, 15 years ago, and we started a relationship. And that led to initially a track two uh, negotiation to try to work on uh, a carbon cap and trade system for China. Well, as many of you may know, there now is a carbon cap and trade system in China on the power sector. It's very similar to the one in the Northeastern states here in the US. So that if we could link the carbon markets in the US, Canada, and uh, China with the carbon market that exists in Europe, you could have by 2025, a price on carbon on about 40% of the world's economy. And uh, that would then allow other subnational and national governments to join in in order to meet their uh, nationally determined contributions to, uh, to the climate solution. Um, so I think that's one of the other keys is putting a price on carbon that, uh, that is meaningful uh, in order to get to those things that are very hard to decarbonize. So I'll leave it at that and just say, I think the solutions are out there, but we need to look to our government for the policy. We need to look to the technology providers to make sure that the policies can be more aggressive and, and more progressive. And then to the finance community that will always be the last to come to the table because they wanna see proof of something over and over again before they put real money to work. But that can happen because it's already happening in different parts of the world. We need it to happen faster everywhere. Thank you. You see, Terry said something really interesting at the end of his remarks. He said that finance is the last to come to the table. And, you know, finance has to 
have a sniff that there's some profit there before it takes its seat at the table. I think that was the implication, if I'm not wrong. Look, frankly, I'm not convinced that this is a private sector matter. Um, a provocation was raised at the beginning of state financing, private financing. I'm not convinced. Um, let's, let's just look at this. There's a climate fund that the UN has established, ask of $100 billion a year. Um, that's, we are not even getting a fraction of the money into that fund. From the private sector, I just don't see it. I mean, I, I don't see the kind of, of, um, of you know, urgency that is necessary. Because let's be frank, some of these investments are not going to deliver a profit. Take the case of India, the purchasing power is just not there, you know, to, um, to dig you out of the massive investment that's needed for the transition. Um, the purchasing power is not there. You're not going to be able to commodify fully the green transition. Questions are raised about degrowth. I think degrowth is a cruel thing to say for a country like India, because most people have not had the opportunity to even you know, abolish hunger, get drinking water and so on. Degrowth is okay to talk about in the richer countries. In the poorer countries, we need to talk about decommodification of some of these things. And I'm just going to put a number on the table. You know, at our institute, we looked around at, at studies of illicit tax havens. By the way, illicit tax haven is not my moral judgment. We did a back of the envelope calculation and we found $40 trillion sitting in illicit tax havens. This is totally unproductive money. You know, why can't we suborn this money? If we're going to talk about money, why can't we suborn this money? Why are we walking around? And I'm just not convinced. I have not seen any good models for a rate of return for the kind of actual investments we need for the genuine transition, not nibbling around the edges. Nibbling around the edges, you can get a rate of return. If you're going to really come at the heart of the problem, I don't think there's a rate of return on the table. I think for that, we need social funding. For that, maybe we need to look at places like military expenditure, over $2 trillion a year now. Maybe we need to look at these illicit tax havens. So throwing down the gauntlet on, you know, is, is capital finance innovation going to unlock the capital? Um, Terry, do you want to do you want to pick up that gauntlet and, and offer some of your perspective? Well, look, I, I would I would absolutely agree with what Vijay said, and in fact, uh, I, I wrote an op-ed a while ago about the the new defense budget that you know climate change is going to get us all. So so a defense budget should be about solving climate change, and when you look at what the United States spends, we could even just take a third of our defense budget; no one would even notice it was gone. And, and you could you could solve climate change in a few years. Uh, kidding aside, no, it's it's uh, it's absolutely where we have to look for the money. But I think to your first point, VJ, is that uh, everything I do in my work now is all around this sense of urgency, because we've dithered too long, we've waited too long. So now we can't ignore any solution. So whether it's getting uh, private capital to get whatever return they have to have. And by the way, I don't think that's a dirty word in the sense that a lot of the private capital comes from pension funds. If they lose the money, are they going to go back to the pensioners next year and say, hey, we, we tried to do something good and, and, and social and green, but we lost a bunch of money. So your pension is going to be 20 percent less this year. You know, they're just not going to take those risks um, and other investors for different reasons, the same thing. So I try to jujitsu that and harness, OK, what is the return you need? Let's find a way to de-risk it. Let's find a way to get you in the game in some substantial amount, because if we just rely on the impact investors and the, the few philanthropic investors, it's not enough. If you can get the trillions of conventional capital into the, into the game, then you have a chance. And yes, it's not enough and it won't be fast enough, but we have to, I just think we have to leave no stone unturned at this point. And yes, we need to push our governments, but you know, think about if you can show an investment might have a return, you're going to get at least some of the wolves sniffing around. But when you go up against the defense industry, you know, I talked about uh, trying to deal with get to a zero waste industry. 
uh, even here in the United States, where the incumbent Waste Management Incorporated and Republic, the two biggest waste haulers here, have such a lock on the landfills and the collection of waste that you, you almost can't talk about new ways to recycle because the more you take out of the garbage can, the less they can put in a landfill and charge cities for their landfill. So there's a lot of this incumbency around the world that we're fighting that takes a long time. But, you know, again, I just come back to this point that uh, I totally agree, VJ, with what you said, but I think we've run out of time to pick either or, not that that's what you were saying, but, but we can't just wait for governments to come to their senses and defend their people, which, by the way, is the number one thing government is responsible to do, is to protect their citizens. And it's the number one thing that every government is failing. Uh, because of climate change. And uh, so, but I think at this point, we've got to, we've got to go anywhere we can and get whatever resources we can and, uh, and make them work. You know, we've just been through and, and some parts of the world are still going through. Um, does the pandemic experience make you more or less hopeful about, um, you know, our capacity to, to mitigate and adapt to to the environmental crisis in the time scale that's required. And, and I feel like, you know, sitting here in London, I, I could argue both ways. Um, less hopeful because of, of our demonstrated capacity to, to um, accept suffering elsewhere in the world, uh, if it could mitigate our own. Um, more hopeful because of the miracle of these mRNA vaccines, research developed, commercialized in, in record time. Um, it really is a kind of, you know, a, a technological miracle. And so I feel that conflict and I, and I feel that tension. Um, I see all of the possibilities for us to innovate our way um, out of the increasing stressors on our present and future. Um, and I also see our, our inability to, you know, to work on it in a global integrated fashion. So I, I'm, I'm curious, how, how you've reflected upon the pandemic experience as it relates to the work you're doing on climate and environment. And just an open question to, to the, the campfire. Well, um, of course, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, it certainly seems that the experience uh, from the pandemic uh, certainly makes me feel less optimistic when it comes to international cooperation when faced with a common threat. <laughs> it didn't come about uh, at all. It was just amazing. If anything that has come close to something that threatened the entire world, all the populations and the economies of all the countries in recent years, it would have been COVID-19. Uh, but yet there has been so little cooperation. I think so little cooperation is an understatement. There has been hostilities much worse, worse than lack of cooperation. I mean, it's been used as, it's been weaponized almost in geopolitical uh, uh, struggles uh, and, and propaganda, you know. So that, that certainly makes us, makes me feel less optimistic about climate uh, and, and our capacity to cooperate uh, and, and, and transcend geopolitical and economic rivalries um, to combat climate change. Um, there are signs of optimism, like you said, uh, technological innovation, and also, um, it, from a Chinese experience, the last two years, the you know state capacity, the, the, the government, the state does have the ability to organize its population against a, 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 a threat like COVID nineteen. But that capacity is very uneven among the countries in the world. Um, so I think it's a it's a difficult lesson, I'd say. I would agree with that. I would just add that. You know, as much as the world didn't come together to address COVID, it did a lot, much more than it's taking the climate crisis seriously. I mean, if if the world came together even as much as it did for COVID for climate in such a short period of time, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in now. And yet it's every bit as much an existential threat. And you can trace more deaths to what's happening from the climate crisis than, than has happened with COVID. And yet again, our governments are not doing the number one thing they're supposed to do, which is to protect their citizens. Sorry, Vijay, go ahead. No, no, Terry, please. Uh, that's an important point. I mean, um, I want to pick up on the mRNA vaccine because it, it really gives us a sense of the advances of technology and the hideousness of our world. Um, 
I agree with you. You know, that was incredible. Um, and by the way, the vaccine was produced, as you know, not all by private initiative, a lot of it government funding in universities and so on. University of Pennsylvania played a role. Um, things we know. Um, we looked at Botswana. At the current rate of vaccination in Botswana, a country in Africa, Botswana will reach 70% of vaccination in the year 2100. J just to underline that, okay? We, we are right now in 2022. At the current rate of vaccination, Botswana will get 70% in 2100. That's the value of mRNA for the people of Botswana. I mean, we have come up with incredible technology around the planet, incredible technology. But the hard barrier between the rich and the poor is insurmountable, you know, and we really need to think seriously about that. Elon Musk, for instance, is now eager to fly his SpaceX satellites over the African continent where he was born in order to provide internet services. Um, in Zambia, 60% of the children who live above the copper, you know, Zambia is one of the world's leading producers of copper. 60% of the Zambian children who live above that copper don't know how to read and write and most likely won't go to school. So under their feet lie the copper, which enable all of us to talk right now. But the children whose parents go and mine the copper can't go to school. I mean, these are the hard realities um, that are going to really prevent us from advancing using the highest form of technology to advance, save the planet, build a better civilization, et cetera. And let, let's be clear about this. Why is Zambia in such a difficult state? Well, you can go to Lusaka and talk to the government if you'd like, but actually you learn more if you fly to Washington, D.C. and talk to the IMF. Um, because what the IMF has done since 1991 to Zambia is extraordinary. I mean, the enforced cuts on education have been systematic. Every year, the government of Zambia is basically told, I mean, talk about democracy. Countries that go to an IMF loan program basically surrender their democratic right to their budget. Uh, budgetary decisions are made by the staff team that comes and visits them. You know, I, I've interacted a lot in Kenya and Zambia with government, the finance ministries, and they tell you directly, there's no point talking to the parliament about the budget. The most important constituency for the budget is in the IMF office in Washington. So, you know, technology is available. I agree with you, Chris, that was an amazing event, you know, the discovery or rather the implementation of mRNA, correct? Incredible how swiftly it came to market and so on. But th therein lies the, lies the rub, how swiftly it came to market, how swiftly it came to market for whom and who could afford it in the market. Um, we are living in a grotesquely unequal world and we can't say that the inequality is you know, because those people are deprived or whatever. I mean, after all, they produce the copper, which is essential to our civilization. You know, copper is not an arcane. We're not talking about the Bronze Age, the Copper Age. We're talking about computers. We're talking about wires. We're talking about uh, many of the micro components inside smartphones and computers. I mean, those minerals and metals are being mined in countries where children have very high literacy, uh, illiteracy rates. They have high illiteracy rates. That has to be on the table. You know, you can't talk about a green transition unless you also talk about democracy and literacy because a country won't be able to have a conversation about moving its social wealth into a green transition if the country has not got the basic fiber of having that conversation, if you see what I mean. You know, other things are what Franz Fanon called obstinate facts, such as hunger. These delay your interest in saving the planet. You, you, you basically say, look, my children are dying. What do I care of the planet? In order to get me to be interested in saving the planet, you got to be able to make me interested in my own life. And I think we forget that sometimes in these conversations. Well, I mean, the IMF is nothing but 
the IMF is but a, a part of a big global financial system that kind of dominates all the political and economic activities of private actors and governments. Um, I mean, I, I think that's probably the big ele elephant in the room. I was thinking about just the, the current sort of political climate in the United States, where it doesn't need to be in, at, 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 at that level of stress. It can simply be in the case of the United States where, you know, cost of living is going up, uh, inflation is rising, um, you know, everybody's worrying about the price of filling, filling up their, their tank of gas. I think Joe Biden, when he was on the campaign trail for president, talked a lot about, uh, about a green agenda. Now, in, in, in 2022, when he's in office, and, and these are the challenges domestically that are, are, are gripping the headlines, it, it would almost seem out of touch for him and his administration to be pushing the climate agenda. It's like, why are you thinking about that when uh, you haven't dealt with uh, the supply chain crisis, when you haven't dealt with inflation, when you haven't dealt with these, with these other questions? And Terry, I wonder, I mean, you've been, you've been, you know, leading the environmental, you know, conversation in your country now for decades. So how do you wedge the conversation into, into the present moment? And I wonder if, if you have thoughts about whether it's going to be the US or China that is going to sort of take the reins of, of, of global leadership when it comes to driving um, some of these hard choices forward? Well, look, I think uh, the planet is making this front and center every day. Um, even the skeptics we saw recently on uh, Fox News, which is our right wing news channel here in the United States that has denied climate for decades. Uh, and I interview recently with a farmer in, in a very right wing state, probably a Trump supporter, as, who finally was admitting that his crops are dying and, and his farm uh, income is devastated. And, and at the end of it, when he was talking to the interviewer, he said, well, I guess this climate thing is real. Um, <laughs> so so even in, in the states and among the population that wasn't taking it seriously, it's affecting everyone. And, mm -hmm. uh, and they're gonna, it's in the news every day now. They're going to see whether it's more fires, more intense storms, sea level rise. Miami was underwater again. Uh, right. Just yesterday, day before, the city of Miami Beach has had to spend $500 million to raise the roads and put in pumps for dry weather flooding because of sea level rise. And the list goes on and on, especially when it comes to agriculture with droughts and, and you know, um, more intense storms and so forth. So I think that's going to get wedged into the conversation. I think there's then, unfortunately, a sense of hopelessness. It's It's not like uh, you know, I don't know if anyone saw the movie Don't Look Up, where Leonardo DiCaprio played a scientist and was trying to tell everyone that there was a meteor, an asteroid headed for Earth, and we could send up a missile and blow it out of the sky if we just acted soon enough. And of course, nobody did, and the worst happened. But there, at least, there was something that governments could get together and do, and the people could demand it, and there was a very clear time window. And I think it's great that China, for example, has five-year plans. I wish the United States and other countries did the same thing because you could then hold your leaders accountable. You could see what's possible. It would take things like, for example, California uh, with its clean car standards or the energy efficiency standards I mentioned before or the incentives for more renewable energy and put that on a national basis and on a sense of national urgency and shared investment and shared sacrifice and so forth, which I think China has done very well in terms of every five years saying, look, here's how we're going to make the country better, more prosperous, cleaner, et cetera. And then, and then look, if it misses a target, it's explained. It's, you know, people say, all right, here's what we have to do better next time. But, uh, but I think that's part of it. So to answer the second half of your question, you know, who's going to take leadership on this? I don't know that it's going to be enough if any one country does. And so far, we've seen that no country, China and the US, each seem to be waiting for each other. And we know there's people in both countries that say, well, if the other country doesn't do it, what does our contribution matter? And unfortunately, sometimes those people win the day. 
but I think that the collective uh, leadership is going to have to come from from many, not from any one. I don't think it's going to be one big superpower that says, okay, here's how we're going to solve this. I think it's going to come from sharing these lessons. You know, sometimes it's the meekest among us. Uh, I remember when the prime minister of the Maldives held a cabinet, minister, a cabinet meeting underwater uh, in order to demonstrate that his country was slowly sinking into, into the Indian Ocean. So it's hard to say what's going to spur people to take more action, especially to make more demands of their people. But I do think that uh, certainly the Chinese model of five-year plans is one thing that we could emulate. And certainly uh, a lot of the work that's been done in both countries um, is, is good. It just needs to go faster uh, and, and all, across the, all across the world. Maybe if I could follow on that and just, Eric, provoke you a bit. I mean, it's great to hear, and I'd love to hear more of just sort of your anecdotal experiences, conversations and, and such around you know, Xi Jinping's personal commitment um, to, to the green agenda, um, to climate change. At least in my life, I haven't seen China step into a kind of leadership role on climate internationally. I mean, if we look at the Kyoto Protocol, if we look at the Paris Climate Accord, um, China, at, from my perspective, wasn't driving that agenda. Came to the table, came on board. I thought that was a really interesting insight uh, around this sort of generational shift from, from giving up the symbol of common and differentiated responsibility to recognize, okay, we're all in this together. But so let me push you on that. Is China going to step forward and start, start pushing the international agenda? Convince me, I guess, is what I'm asking you to do. No, I will say, I think what the Chinese will do is that, you know, like I said, there are, you know, China is now the world's largest industrial base. China makes everything for the world. Uh, now, obviously, in the, the process of making these things for the world, we emit a lot of carbon dioxide <laughs> into, into the environment. So I think what China will do is to figure out ways, both through government and state actions, in, through political actions, but also uh, a market innovation to figure out a way to improve this, these industrial processes so that they, they, they help the climate, they, they, they reduce carbon emissions. So if, they, if China could do that, I mean, that's a huge portion of the world's industrial capacity, of the world's industrial production that everybody uses uh, around the globe. I'm a venture capitalist, so you know, I, we see this. There are two, two, two aspects to it. One is, I mean, you know, our experience the last 20, 30 years is that when it comes to the environment, it's just, you know, the market and innovation and private sector, it's just not going to cut it. It's just, you know, that, that didn't solve the air problem in Beijing, okay? It didn't solve any of these, the, the, the lake or the rivers, the, the, all the stuff I talked about. So the most important actor is the state through collective and political actions and through politics. I mean, I think that, you know, that, that China does have that capacity. Not to say that the market and entrepreneurship don't matter, they do. For instance, the two biggest industries that uh, China had been able to build, one is solar panels. Um, now that homes in California, before they put on these tariffs, <laughs> homes in California, they, no ordinary people could actually buy solar panels at reasonable cost that they can pay back which was a fraction of the, what they had to pay 10 years ago uh, when the costs were so high, uh, it didn't pay. Uh, and China made that possible. Uh, so solar panel. Uh, second is EV, electric vehicle. Uh, China is becoming the, the biggest producer, I think one of the biggest producers of EV and, and will be the biggest producer of EV for the world. Both industries in the beginning were seeded by the state, by the government. Uh, we all talk about consumption subsidies, right? If you buy EV, these subsidies are actually less important. What's the most important for those two industries is what I call capital subsidy. So in the beginning, government fronted the capital because there's no private capital, including myself, would invest in that stuff because it's too risky uh, and, and returns are too low. But once the government subsidized the capital, then private capital will come in to fund the incentive-driven activities that we could leverage on the government state capital. 
So, so, so they fixed the return on capital problem. Uh, then the market kicked in. So all these processes, all these sectors, I could see new technologies are emerging that if, if the government, uh, if the state could provide capital incentive, then private capital comes in and to innovate for technologies to reduce emission. I mean, I think that's the biggest contribution China can make because it's, it's the industrial base for the world. I guess around our campfire is, you know, there are very different roles of the state represented um, in, in the different countries that the three of you have grown up in. So, you know, Eric, let's, let's tackle that one head on. I mean, is, is the kind of strong state, kind of totalitarian state, that's probably the wrong word, but fine, you know, leave that aside, system in China a, a better state model to drive the transition to a green economy? Well, I think there's no question. Again, this before you, you speak, because I want to say something about the premise of the question, Chris, if you don't Good. mind. Yeah. Um, because yeah, I think the premise, Chris, is entirely wrong. Um, hmm. There are no weak states in the world. The United States is also a strong state. Um, hmm. India is a strong state. China is a strong state. I think the term authoritarian is very misleading. Um, the United States is a very strong state. Um, in what way is it a strong state? You have massive interventions through the security services, the police, the military, and so on. It's a very powerful interventionist state where it wants to intervene. Uh, it creates its own markets. It sets markets. During the beginning of the Great Depression in 2007, 2008, the United States decided to basically bring money down to zero, much ahead of the European Central Bank, bailed out the Europeans as a consequence, a very strong state. I could use that term authoritarian mischievously, and I could say it's authoritarian on behalf of finance, you know, um, against the people. During the pandemic, um, you saw the state essentially withdraw from its benevolent aspect. Uh, in other countries, in China, for instance, the state intervened in the benevolent aspect to shut down a pandemic. I think we have a very bad understanding of states in the Western world because we've accepted the, um, the ideology of these states, you know, that the market reigns supreme, the state has shrunk and so on. I don't think neoliberalism shrunk the state. I think it, in fact, eviscerated the benevolent capacity of the state. Um, social welfare programs, intervention for the good, and so on. But it didn't shrink the state by, by, for God's sake, just look at a graph of the U.S. government budget. Uh, when is the sh state shrunk? The budget continues to rise. The question is priorities have shifted, Chris. So in that sense, there's a strong state in the United States. It simply doesn't act benevolently for the people who require assistance, support, and succor. So sorry, Eric, I just wanted to make that point clearly because I feel like otherwise we enter into a kind of cliche, you know, about the China has a strong state, the United States, the state is weak and so on. I just think that's a very wrong way of looking at things. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, I, really appreciate, I really appreciate that I provoked you. <laughs> um, <laughs> thanks, so, thanks so Vijay. Look, I, I think there's no question that the, the, the strength of the state is critical, required to, to deal with the climate challenge. Um, and, and I think Vijay is right. It's really about the end of the state. Yeah, I agree. The U.S. does have a strong state. But right now, the, the state, I think, is, you know, is, is captured by interests or, or people that, that make it incapacitated, impotent in dealing with the climate change, I think, and many other challenges. Um, well, the Chinese state has its own problems, uh, but the Chinese state, um, I hope, I mean, certainly during the pandemic, it came for, for us uh, in a big way, I think in a healthy and, and, and positive way in the last two years. Uh, it has its problems, but, but by and large, it, it protected the people uh, in, a, in a significant way. Um, the, uh, in terms of the climate, like I said, I hope, I mean, the last five, 10 years, we made big progress because the, st the state came in. You know, before we had a strong state too, when we had huge environmental degradation. The environmental degradation we experienced for 20, 30 years was actually, you could argue, led by the state, <laughs> by a strong state because it was all GDP, right? 
Um, then, then we pivoted. We say, hey, we can't do this anymore. And the state made it its end to intervene. Uh, so we, they changed the incentives for, for local governments uh, as just not GDP. Um, there is now environmental green GDP, for instance, you know, that, that factor into uh, how they promote uh, officials. We had the same strong state, maybe even stronger state, when we had the environmental degradation, both partly uh, led by the state. Um, so it's really about the end of the state, I think. For bringing it is, you know, kind of stepping back, we've talked a lot about uh, the role of the state. Um, we've talked a lot about the role of market forces, of financial innovation uh, in helping us to, to move faster with greater urgency on climate change. We haven't mentioned um, human rights. Maybe, maybe VJ, you, you, you offered a, a pathway to do and, and I didn't take it. So I'm gonna maybe come back to it, come back to it now. We haven't really talked about, you know, um, our environmental security, um, nature as a human rights agenda. And I wonder, is that because that's too weak a leg to, to advocate it on? It's just not going to push through the hard and practical challenges of a transition? Or are we to blame for that, that we don't put it in, those fra in that frame and advocate it in that frame? So we've made it um, a weaker leg to stand on. Frankly, I can't think of a, a, a bigger human rights issue than climate change. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it takes a, it's a different, you know, human rights, uh, I think from the beginning, uh, after World War II, especially in the last several decades, has been framed in a particular way, in, in a liberal way, if you would, around the individual. And there's a different way of looking at human rights, which is a collective way of looking at human rights. And I, and I think that that kind of change in framework is what's required uh, to have to address this, I, I believe, the most pressing and most, you know, most critical human rights issue of our time, which is climate change. It affects the collective so much more than just the individual. So human rights need to be shifted, I think, conceptually towards more towards the collective uh, for, for that to be to be addressed correctly. <laughs> the brand of human rights has been greatly damaged, sadly. It's been weaponized. Just look at this, okay? Uh, the United States is called a summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, set to begin in a few days. Um, it is said that it will not invite Nicaragua, Cuba, Venezuela. Meanwhile, Mr. Biden travels to Saudi Arabia. There was no problem with that. Uh, Mr. Biden has more trouble with Cuba than with Saudi Arabia. Th that strikes people as hypocritical. You know, they'll talk a lot about the human rights violations in Venezuela and Nicaragua and Cuba, but he goes to Saudi Arabia before he's flying to a summit of democracy. So there is a way in which the concept human rights has made people quite suspicious. And it has degraded the concept, frankly. People around the world are not dancing to the same tune of this concept. I, I feel this in a, in a horrible way, because I think the Declaration of International Declaration of Human Rights from 1948 is an amazing, amazing text. But there has been, let's be, admit, let's be frank and admit it, there has been a damage to the idea of human rights. That's why in our world, we talk about the dilemmas of humanity rather than human rights. Um, there are great compelling dilemmas of humanity. You know, the ability to live with dignity, ability to eat, the ability to live on a planet where you can survive with it, where the dignity of nature is also enshrined. You know, we need to revive these concepts because I'm telling you, Chris, you walk into some places, some countries, and you start talking about human rights and eyebrows are raised. Um, people just don't want it anymore, you know, because they think that's the first step uh, to some sort of regime change agenda. Sadly, sadly, it should never have been allowed to be weaponized like that. So, yes, of course. Um, the right to live, in fact, is a human right, the, the principal right. And if your islands are going to be submerged, if your coastline is going to be submerged, if you're facing catastrophic weather events, if, if there's the desiccation you know, of, of the Sahel region, the Sahara is, is, is growing southward, 
this is making it impossible for, for people to live a bare life you know a ordinary life so their human rights are completely violated by this look we're at the stage where we're not even able through the un system to establish the concept of climate refugee and countries like australia have refused to allow the concept climate refugee because they believe that they will be um you know the first staging point for destination for these climate refugees and you might have seen the uh, dilemma at at manaus island where australia offshores its um its its refugees uh, very much like uh, lampedusa in italy offshore refugees so they don't come onto continental europe the concept of human rights needs to either be taken away from the weaponizer and then we can talk seriously about it without embarrassment or we need to find a new way of talking about these same issues that are actually more compelling to people mm-hmm.